You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are The Addiction Doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to The Addiction Files. We are talking about crack cocaine tonight, and this is sometimes a, a forgotten drug, but something that most of our patients have experience with. So it's important to understand and understand even the economic impact that it's had and especially the marginalized populations that this affects. So Paula, do you want to give us an introduction and we'll go into some of the history associated with this and definitely the economic factors that play into why specifically crack became such a um, horrendous drug, I think, in certain populations. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I actually, I think we say this a lot at the beginning of our podcast, but I cannot believe we've waited till now to do an episode on crack. And I actually am embarrassed because it's like crack falls through the cracks uh, for a very cheesy pun. And it shouldn't. It's an important substance because of its impact. And it's an important substance historically because of the population it impacts. It impacts largely marginalized populations. And so for that reason alone, we should not have neglected to talk about it specifically until now. We did talk about cocaine. Uh, Let's see, we recorded it in 2021. Can you imagine that? We've been doing this for a long time. So go back and listen to our first episode on cocaine for a background on that chemical, but we'll give you a good review right now as well, and then talk specifically about crack cocaine. Crack cocaine is a form of processed cocaine, so it's the same compound in general, it's just processed, and it was made popular in the 1980s. In fact, it had a huge spike in popularity in the early 1980s. From 1982 to 1985, users of crack in the U.S. increased by about 1.5 to 1.6 million people. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but mostly it was due to the cost and profitability margins of crack versus powdered cocaine. And it had a higher euphoric effect versus insufflated cocaine. Uh, Why is it called crack? Well, it's called crack because of the crackling sound it makes when it's being processed. So when it's being cooked down and Darlene is going to talk about how that how it actually is made. And like I just mentioned, it has historical importance for the country um, of the United States due to its impact on black communities and inner cities, particularly and the response of the U.S. legal system with mass incarceration and an acceleration on the war on drugs, particularly in the late 1980s and the and the 1990s, resulting in huge, um, you know, basically legal effects on people using crack cocaine with extremely harsh punishments, punishments flooding our jail and prison systems with particularly black people with crack cocaine charges. And there's been, there's a lot to be said about this. And you know, I don't claim to be an expert on this. I don't think you do either, Darlene. But if you look back on the history of drugs, and there's some lots of interesting books on this and the history of harm reduction. And even as you look at the opioid epidemic and how the US has taken focused um, approach to the opioid epidemic, versus the crack cocaine epidemic, which was said to be basically the 1980s, early 1990s, the response was drastically different. And uh, we need to acknowledge that we neglected to address the crack cocaine epidemic. And and it's, it seems apparently just because we didn't make the effort to do so because of it, its impact on Black communities, uh, as opposed to the opioid epidemic. And so Um, There's something to be said about that. Now, crack cocaine was highly utilized in the 1980s and 90s, and then it kind of, the use decreased a bit, and we'll go into epidemiology in a bit, um, but there's some interesting things to talk about there. So first of all, I think it'll be good to talk a little bit more about the history of crack and cocaine in general. So why don't you tell us a bit more about that? It's an interesting history lesson looking back at the social and economic factors that led to the crack epidemic. 
And it teaches us some important lessons on approaches to substance use in general. Much of this was taken from a paper by Dunlap and Johnson, and this came from the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. And although it's a much older paper, it's still very relevant to today. This was titled The Setting for the Crack Era, Macro Forces and Micro Consequences. And three important events happened in the 1960s and 70s that created an environment for a drug such as crack to become so popular and so devastating at the same time. So one of them was really related to the outsourcing of manufacturing jobs. So they left the manufacturing jobs left the US for cheap labor abroad and that left many urban laborers unemployed. That combined with continued movement movement from urban to suburban living and the continued participation in race, racist and ethnic housing discrimination leaving urban black neighborhoods kind of clustered in an impoverished areas. Social programs that initially were started in the 1960s to address these poverty-stricken areas um, were largely abandoned when the Vietnam War became center stage. And towards the end of the 1970s was just fraught with superinflation, much to what we're dealing with now, and the housing crisis. I can even recall my parents telling me in the late 1970s about assuming somebody else's mortgage just to be able to get an interest rate of 14%. So the housing crisis affected Black and ethnic minorities more than their white counterpart. Compared to minorities were paying 47% of their monthly income towards housing and up to 70% in larger urban areas versus their white counterparts who were only paying 27% of their monthly income. That alone would lead to just a disease of despair. The HIV AIDS epidemic really became center stage in the 1980s and was also linked to IV drug use. So. Now we have the introduction of a cheap, easily produced drug that can be smoked and provides an intense high like IV drug use does without the same risks and the stigma associated with IV use. So going back a little bit, cocaine for years was primarily a drug only used by the affluent due to its high cost. So it was, it, and this was, we're going back to the 1970s, but it was averaging back then three to $600 per gram. So it wasn't, and it wasn't practical to sell it in a fraction of a gram. So that's why it was really only among the affluent, but crack was easily made. And this was by so it was it was easily made and it was cheap. So one piece of a rock of crack would sell for five to ten dollars in the 1980s. So, and then and how it was made is by just combining cocaine with water and sodium bicarb was the easiest, also known as baking soda and heating. The name crack comes from the cracking sound in the heating process. And actually from just an article on Wikipedia, even some of the purer forms of crack would have kind of the density, a little bit slightly higher density than candle wax and would resemble kind of a hard, brittle plastic. So to kind of give you a picture of that. So now we've set the stage is we have impoverished neighborhoods, lots of unemployed workers. We have a housing crisis with super inflation and just general despair. Add in a cheap, easily made and accessible drug that now anyone can access and sell. And this can easily supplement your household.
And your household is now a household of four or five non-nuclear family members because you have your uncle, your cousin, and your cousin's friend all cohabiting with you because that's all, that's how you can survive. And they now will recruit you to come sell with them because that's, you can see that's the only way that you can afford a car and that's how you get food. The second thing that really stood out with this is the route of smoking, being able to smoke crack because this appealed to women and it was at the time IV heroin use was far more common in the 1980s and 1970s among men rather than women. It wasn't generally socially acceptable for females to be, to be using IV, but smoking was made acceptable by cannabis. And so a smoked drug was acceptable. So we have another now smoke drug that creates this intense high that is very similar to an IV high. And so this was very appealing. And societal response to this was, as Paula, if you've already and already talked about this, was this mass incarceration and harsh prison sentence. And in one article I read, I mean, it was reported the they talked about the hundred to one rule, like the sentencing was almost a hundred times longer for a crack, a crack charges versus cocaine. And really it, it was black versus white. This type of response further destabilized Black communities, taking parents and caregivers away from children, resulted in you would have like a single grandmother or single female raising multiple generations of children, and again, in extreme poverty. And this is just a brief summary and gives us just a glimpse of the devastating consequences of systemic racism, generational poverty, and how one drug can just completely devastate neighborhoods and families. So in a complete difference when the opiate epidemic hit, because this was an epidemic that was just, like you said, largely ignored, which is, I think it's one of the biggest tragedies. So I don't know. I kind of explained that a little clunkily, but no, that's so I interesting. Think, that's really, it's really interesting. Yeah. Go into Paula that some of the epidemiology and then I think we. Okay, so epidemiology of crack cocaine use is a little bit tricky to um, separate from cocaine use in the data. Uh, so I do have a generalization surprisingly hard to find out how many people are using crack versus powdered cocaine. But according to the NASDA study uh, data of 2023, uh, people over the age of 12 years old in the U.S. report a 1.8% use of cocaine in the past year. So that's not specifically uh, crack. And they say that 4.1% of 12th graders have a lifetime use of cocaine. Um, 1% of the population currently use cocaine, like, and that would be two, they reckon, they reckon that it's about two thirds cocaine and one third crack use. That's about the divide. I think a lot of it's regional, honestly. Um, we see a lot more crack use in the South, on the East Coast, uh, versus you know, in the Northeast, you see more powdered cocaine, and on the West Coast, you see more powdered cocaine. I have to say that I've seen more crack cocaine use in the last couple of years personally in my clinical practice than I ever have. Um, so who knows, you know, borders merge. We see a pretty much equal use of cocaine across races and ethnicities. 
Certainly a drug that's mostly used by young adults, 18 to 25 is the most common age group followed by 25 to 34 year olds. And we are seeing a remarkable increase in deaths from cocaine related causes in the last 10 years as stimulant deaths continue to rise. In fact, we've seen a threefold increase in cocaine related deaths over the past 10 years. And data from 2017, which is quite old now, showed that cocaine was involved in one out of five overdose deaths. And, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the data is um, emerging now, because we're seeing obviously a terrible increase in stimulant related deaths. And that includes both cocaine, crack and amphetamine type stimulants. Why is this so addictive and why are people seeking it out? So how does it affect the brain? So like the other stimulants that we just talked about, and I think that's so interesting, the regional kind of differences that we see. I think a little bit what you talk about, it probably again goes back to some of those affluence and economic factors, mm -hmm. but it has stimulants in general affect, they, they, ha, they, they facilitate activity of monoamine neurotransmitters. So what does that mean? That's dopamine, but also norepinephrine, serotonin, and those are all the things that make us feel good, not depressed. We are familiar with those in medications that we even prescribe. And they affect on the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. Both cocaine and amphetamine act at the presynaptic monoamine reuptake transporters, but they work in slightly different ways. And we've gone into that in some of our other episodes. Cocaine in particular, and that includes crack because they have the same mechanism, is it's a reuptake inhibitor, which means it blocks the action or that reuptake transporter. So what that means is it allows that dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin to stay active and on that on those synapses longer. That's what it's doing. That's some of the effects with intoxication. So what does that look like? Well, because it acts centrally and peripherally, we get mental or psychological effects, and then we also get physical effects um, in terms of immediate intoxication effects from the use of crack cocaine. Um, I mean, obviously it's used to increase, to, to have a euphoric effect, increase energy, libido, reduce fatigue, increase um, concentration, it ends up reducing appetite as well. Unfortunately, it causes insomnia and can really increase hostility and aggression. It can cause paranoia, panic, anxiety, um, auditory and or visual hallucinosis and picking, like this uh, preoccupation with picking at the skin. We um, see physical effects, and these effects come from activity on the adrenergic system, and they're dose-dependent. So the more you use, the more um, effects you have on the central nervous system. And these this results in high heart rate and high blood pressure, so we call that tachycardia and hypertension, which can sometimes be catastrophic. Um, we also see people with dilated pupils. They can get flushed red skin. Diet, they can become diaphoretic or very sweaty. They can have um, arrhythmias, so their heart can beat in an abnormal fashion. And then they can also get hyperthermic. So their body temperature can rise all the way up to as high as 45 degrees. They can become tremulous. They can certainly have nausea and vomiting, and they can actually experience acute coronary syndrome where their blood pressure gets so high and the constriction of their blood vessels gets intense, including the constriction of the small blood vessels supplying blood to your heart that you get basically a heart attack. You get vasoconstriction of blood to the heart muscle, the myocardium, and people go into it, what's called acute cardiac syndrome where the heart muscle suffers a loss of oxygen and is no longer able to pump efficiently, people develop extreme chest pain and infarction or lack of oxygen and damage to the heart tissue, which can result in either death, arrhythmia, or over a prolonged period, um, heart failure, because the heart tissue gets damaged and gets scarred down and then begins to lose its activity. And you end up with kind of a dilated or a big baggy heart. We also see neurological effects with crack cocaine use 
immediately and long term. And that, again, is probably related to this flooding of the neurotransmitters that cause uh, constriction of the blood vessels to the brain. And then, of course, all the psychoactive effects that we just talked about when you flood the brain with this extended period of high levels of particularly dopamine, um, norepinephrine, and then also serotonin, which I think have something to do with the uh, hallucinations. Um, people often present to emergency departments with crack or cocaine and or cocaine toxicity. And in our first episode in 2021, we did talk about the management of the acute effects of um, cocaine overdose. And we just recently, I think it was this year, was it 2023? I think it was this year, we released an episode on overamping on stimulants and what that looks like. So when people really overshoot and become intoxicated beyond a comfortable feeling, with their stimulant, whether it's cocaine, crack cocaine, um, amphetamines, either from like methamphetamine or prescription amphetamines. And that's a really good episode. So I would listen to that so that you understand what that looks like and how you manage it. Because basically it can be life-threatening. Oh, one other thing, two other things I need to mention. One, you can have such a significant vasoconstriction of blood vessels in the brain, you can have a stroke. And you can also have a hemorrhage of blood vessels where blood pressure gets so high that people just basically burst blood vessels in their brain and they end up bleeding out in their brain. And uh, Darlene, you and I have both seen young patients who've suffered terrible consequences from strokes related to cocaine, uh, particularly crack or cocaine use. Um, the other thing you would need to be aware of, I guess, is rhabdomyolysis. You see people who've had crack or cocaine and or cocaine intoxication, and they end up um, getting into such a hyperadrenergic state, high blood pressure, high heart rate, high temperature, no sleep, no uh, poor appetite that they end up not drinking enough and uh, breaking down muscle um, enzymes and then end up with kidney damage as they try to metabolize all the waste products of those broken down muscle fibers. One caveat, and I have never forgotten this. I learned the second year as a medical student on my ER rotation and a, a cocaine heart attack came in. And one thing is you can't always trust your ECG findings you need to make sure you're getting those cardiac enzymes because it doesn't always look like your typical, um, it, it, you don't always see your typical ischemia. And also because these are also young patients. And so they may, it may not always have your normal presentation like that. So history is incredibly important to always ask about substances used and then that's, I mean, that's fairly standard in most emergency departments, but getting those and getting those cardiac enzymes so that you can see that muscle damage, like you were just talking about. Paula, like when you look at some of these, we touched on this, but just pregnancy effects. Why is like crack and cocaine so like, devastating with pregnant women? I think it has to do with lots of reasons, but primarily because of the devastating effect on the placenta with chronic vasoconstriction, and you end up with poor fetal growth. So you have low birth weight infants and yes, placental abruption. The placenta has no autoregulation of blood pressure, and so it's all coming from the mother. And so when you're using stimulants like that, it, it just is out of control. So if you have hypertension, it just, that's why you get fetal uh, intrauterine growth retardation and it can, that's why it's just, and so generally then it's just this downstream effect. It's why you can cause hemorrhage, strokes and abruption. It's just because of the consequences of normal substance use. Then there's also infectious disease. Yes. You know? HIV. Yeah. All the sexual related um, harms for with stimulant use, and then of course any other, you know, infectious diseases. With crack, typically it's smoked, so you don't worry as much about injection use. Although, of course, in any person who is experiencing a substance use disorder, you want to 
have precautions, but you have the pulmonary effects of smoking a drug. And then the risks of actually smoking a drug, like light, having a pipe, having a lame, yeah. having um, equipment that's not reliable and not sterile, and uh, transmitting diseases like hepatitis C through shared gear, shared equipment, yeah. um, even if it's not injected. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent point. Yes. And then I kind of went down, this is more related to cocaine, but I kind of went down a rabbit hole here on adulterants, but I thought this was fascinating. So I'm just sharing this with you, Paula, because this was really new to me and I didn't know this before. I just found this fascinating paper it was by, I think it's Kudlasek. And this was titled Cocaine Adulteration. And this came out in the Journal of Chemistry and Neuroanatomy in June of 2017. And I just thought, one, why do they use particular substances when as adulterants? Because cocaine seems to have about three primary substances. So the common things that you'll see, we all know about levamisil. And we'll go into that has some really terrible, like, side effects of levamisil. But that's a that's probably about seventy percent of of the cocaine supply is can is cut with levamisil. But then they have tested and found. I mean, you can see it cut with other amphetamines, synthetic cathinones, and analgesics, caffeine, hydroxazine, of all mm -hmm. things. That was something that I wasn't aware of. Yeah. So this is what is, you one, you want to be able to mimic the anesthetic property of cocaine, because we know that some, if you go back to the history of cocaine, it had its uses around the early you know, 1900s. We used it as an anesthetic, right? It has a bitter taste. It was, you know, that, that you know, some people always ask, is it really true? It was, you know, it was in Coca-Cola for a brief period of time. And it kind of gives it that kind of zing, that taste. And so it has, to, if you're going to cut it into the drug, it's got to have the mim. It's got to be close to cocaine. So it's got to have. It's got to be bitter, and it's got to mimic that anesthetic property. And so that's why they're looking for specific drugs that can have those similar properties. Also, its melting point. This is what's key: is it's got to have a similar melting point. Uh, it was really interesting in this paper, this came from Austria and particularly Vienna. They have a program there called Check It, where people can for free bring their drugs to have it tested. Yeah, and cool. so about 50% of this was from people who voluntarily bought drugs to check it. And then the rest came from seized drugs mm -hmm. and other sources like that. But it really it was really fascinating because... That's what they found is about 70% of it was levamisil. So most of their drug supply in, in, that, in Austria was cut with levamisil. 30 per, it, it varied, but over the years, so this, was, this did follow for a couple of years, the purity fluctuated, but it remained that 30 to 40% of it was still the alterant not the pure cocaine. So, and there's about 10% of the supplies were, were cutting agent with no cocaine, which was a little bit mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. well, Levamisil itself actually seems to have some effect where it, it actually works on the stimulant. It actually works with the stimulant on almost potentiating it a little bit. So that's why it's such a popular cutting agent, but it has really terrible effects what and so one of the ones like paula and you can tell us this like it can cause the agranulocytosis which can be life-threatening then the vasculitis and you've seen this i know in your clinic which is just terrible and then you can see the leukoencephalopathy and so that's that 
just basically almost like a like brain cortical thickness reduction and then even kidney damage so you can see even acute renal failure from it and it's metabolite actually uh, so there's in the metabolite of levamisil aminorex which also is being used as a cutting agent by itself which is kind of interesting so that was just kind of as a side note. So treatment for crack cocaine is the same as cocaine. And it's very important because cocaine and crack are extremely addictive. In fact, there's this competition. It's not a good competition, but in terms of what is the most addictive drug. And, you know, for a while, there's been research studies showing and they've scored drugs in terms of impact and how many people after first use end up with a use disorder, et cetera. And for a while, heroin was like at the top of that list. It seems like, according to an article in in uh, July or June of, of 2024, published by the Addiction Center, um, cocaine is number one, and crack cocaine is above powdered cocaine. And this is because it just has such an immediate euphoric effect. It's very fast acting and it causes an extremely euphoric effect. So treatment is very important uh, in terms of what do we do to help people who are just stuck in the cycle where they can't seem to get out of it. Well, we've talked about this before in terms of treatment of stimulant use disorder. In fact, we just had an episode on reviewing the ASAM stimulant treatment guideline, which I would refer to honestly, just refer you to that um, to discuss the treatment of cocaine use disorder. There's also, um, you know, information in our previous cocaine episode on how to treat cocaine use disorder. However, as a review, we do want to remind you to evaluate patients with a stimulant use disorder. So evaluate your patient who's presenting using crack, evaluate them, get a good history, evaluate them for other substance use, Are they using any substances IV? How do they use their stimulant? What are their smoking-related harms? What physical sequela may they be presenting with or not presenting with that you need to be aware of? Like we already discussed some of the cardiac and neurological risks. They may have renal and hepatic um, risks. And of course, you do need to be really careful and evaluate for their mental status exam since the presence of paranoia and hallucinosis and even SI and HI are not uncommon with people who use uh, crack cocaine and cocaine. So you want to get a really good history and an exam. And of course, you may or may not want to have a urine drug screen to confirm whether or not someone is using cocaine. Treatment, we do not have a FDA approved medication for stimulant use disorder. However, we do have some behavioral treatments that have been well studied. And those include contingency management as at the top of the list, and that is a method of rewarding people for negative urine drug screens. And you reward them based on accumulation of drug screens, so you incentivize more and more negative drug screens with rewards that may be as small as a dollar or as big as a jumbo prize, like $50 or $100. Um, there are different models of contingency management. There's a very good um, model that comes out of the VA that's published by a psychologist who's run a program with the VA for many decades. And he has a program that's either rewards people with cash or rewards people with vouchers. And we have pretty good data that it helps people maintain abstinence from all stimulants, but particularly cocaine. We also know that community reinforcement approach is effective. So that's bringing in family therapy, other community supports, having multiple types of groups, as well as individual therapy is effective at reducing cocaine use. And then the matrix model, which is very similar actually to the community reinforcement approach, where you use not only therapeutic approaches to help people stop or reduce their cocaine use, but actually, and no surprise that this is effective, looks at social determinants of health and looks at the other needs of the person in terms of helping them achieve sobriety goals, acknowledging that most people cannot stop using drugs if they're still living in unsafe or no housing. They're living in communities where everyone's using, if they're living in communities or environments that have violence and they don't want to assure their own personal or mental safety. Um, And so we look at housing first models, we look at food insecurity, 
We look at access to healthcare as a major barrier. So the matrix model tries to address all of that with aggressive case management and wraparound services. Additionally, just like everything else in medicine, CBT uh, has efficacy for treating cocaine use disorder. So um, there's actually newer studies, just to mention, looking at web-based platforms to treat cocaine use disorder, and they have been proven to be effective. So when you're treating patients and you're feeling like, what do I even do? I mean, I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to treat this. This seems like a bigger problem than we have resources for. The World Wide Web, as all of its applications, have now many free and also paid for applications to help people with treatment, especially stimulant use disorder. And then they've also specifically looked at telehealth. So NIDA has looked at telehealth as a mode of treating cocaine use disorder, and it is effective. A brief review of pharmacotherapy, again, referring you back to the ASAM stimulant guideline for a full comprehensive um, tutorial on how to treat cocaine use disorder, and that's available to everyone for free. You can download that guideline from the internet and review it, and you can just review the key summary points rather than read the whole 100-page something document. But pharmacotherapy, many medications have been studied and not all of them always come through on every single study. However, the ASAM stimulant guideline recommends using bupropion for patients who specifically have a cocaine use disorder, especially those who have a tobacco use disorder and or have major depressive disorder. So consider the use of bupropion, also, topiramate has been studied with cocaine use disorder, and I have to say that would be that's my go-to medication that I use for stimulant use disorder with cocaine. It's especially helpful for patients who have a co-occurring alcohol use disorder. And we didn't go into cocaethylene um, or the product that you end up with when you combine cocaine and alcohol, but it's a very, very addictive new substance that hits the brain. And this is why topiramate may be very helpful because we very commonly see crack and or powdered cocaine used in combination with alcohol. So keep at the top of your list, bupropion and topiramate. There are some findings that maybe modafinil is helpful for acute withdrawal and acute early cravings for, for cocaine. However, I would caution people to really read the stimulant guidelines before you go prescribing modafinil for patients with cocaine use disorder and you understand the indication and the treatment guidelines around that controlled substance. Similarly, there are some recommendations in the ASAM stimulant guideline on the use of stimulants for cocaine use disorder, but this is only meant for people who have co-occurring ADHD and, and this is a huge and, if you are an addiction medicine or addiction psychiatrist board certified provider who can provide that treatment and provide the necessary monitoring to go along with it. So in other words, you should not prescribe stimulants for cocaine use disorder unless you're an addiction medicine or an addiction psychiatry board certified provider and you can provide the right support around it. Otherwise, think about topiramate and bupropion. There's some information that maybe disulfiram is helpful. There's some other medications of interest that we could keep watching. There are, um, well, NIDA is working on a vaccine to wow. help with um, antibodies that would block the, um, you know, basically block the blood brain barrier um, transmission of cocaine into the brain. And so you can watch that. I mean, we've been keeping an eye on that for years and years and years. So we're watching that. And in the meantime, rely heavily on your behavioral treatments, and then those pharmacotherapies at the top of the list. Now, thank you, Paula. That was a fantastic summary. And I think sometimes it gets really discouraging <laughs> when the patients come in. But it, it's like you said, ask about co-use and use it because I think that's really frequent. That's fairly frequent. And I think it's really important. Try that and offer, offer treatment when appropriate. Recognizing these social determinants of health that you talked about, because I think this is particularly can be devastating to just communities. I think stimulants in general, we're seeing that and recognizing the consequences of use 
and treating those. And just, Paula, thank you. Thank you for a great episode. Thank you. Until next time. Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from the source. As each person is unique, you're advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on the show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.